Japanese Buddhism is almost as old as Japanese civilization, or at least as old as written civilization. And that's because some of the same people who brought writing to Japan, early scribes, were also Buddhist monks. Chinese sources suggest that Buddhism was introduced to Japan in the 460 CE, although the more widely accepted date is 552 CE. That's when the king of Baekje sent a mission to Japan, a mission that included monks, nuns, and Buddhist texts. In either case, whether it's the 460s or the 550s or somewhere in between, Japanese Buddhism is about as old as the earliest written records in Japan. So what was Buddhism? And why was it appealing in ancient Japan? Well, by the time Buddhism got to Japan, it was already a millennium old. Buddhism had emerged from Hinduism in North India in roughly the 5th century BCE. The exact historical origins of Buddhism are much murkier than those of Christianity or Islam or Confucianism. But Buddhism spread up into China and then the Korean Peninsula, and by the time it reached Japan, it was a mature religion that had already split into multiple sects. And those sects disagreed on some key points of doctrine. But across all those ancient sects, we can find a few core ideas that were held in common. First, Buddhism assumes reincarnation. You will be reborn after you die. Which sounds great, but in Buddhism, this is actually a bad thing, because ordinary lives are full of decay and loss. Here's a quick rundown of why reincarnation stinks. Imagine every possible measure of success. Money, for example. Certainly money is nice, but you can't take it with you. So you spend your life getting rich, and then you lose it all. Okay, what about power? Well, power almost seems to have an air of immortality about it. We remember powerful people after their deaths. Although that's not really true. How many of you can name 10 Egyptian pharaohs, 10 Hittite kings, 10 secretaries of the treasury, these were really powerful people to their contemporaries. And today, even for a highly educated audience, they are forgotten. But what about love? Who could argue against loving and being loved? Well, if you are a deeply loving person, you love your spouse, your kids, your friends, and then you have the pleasure of watching them all get old, get sick, and die. Unless you get sick and die first, which is possibly the better option. So Buddhism makes the remarkable observation that reincarnation is actually a trap. Even if you are a deeply moral person, you are stuck in an endless cycle of disappointment and loss. So from a Buddhist perspective, you actually don't want to be reborn. You want to transcend the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And that transcendence is called nirvana. So the goal of Buddhism then is to attain nirvana, to stop being reborn, to reach an alternate plane of being that is beyond the vicissitudes of human desire. And those who attain nirvana are known as Buddhas, enlightened beings. In Buddhism, there is more than one Buddha. There is the historical Buddha, known as Gautama Siddhartha, who was born in North India in the 5th century BCE. But there were Buddhas before that, and there will be Buddhas in the future. And they all exist in a plane, in a realm that's beyond our comprehension. Now, if that sounds too ethereal, you are not alone. 
And in practice, many Buddhists throughout history have been quite content with half steps. So while the ultimate goal might be achieving nirvana, in practice, many people have been quite content with more modest goals, like maybe a few hundred really good reincarnations, maybe richer and more handsome, more powerful each time. And then I'll get around to attaining nirvana and become a Buddha. Many of you probably know St. Augustine's famous prayer, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. Well, many Buddhists think the same about nirvana. And as we'll see, Buddhism has room for those more modest expectations. So what do you do as a Buddhist to move along spiritually, first towards a better rebirth, and then ultimately towards nirvana? Well, for a better rebirth, the rules are unremarkable. Don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't murder, don't be mean to other people or other living things. Give money to Buddhist temples. No big surprises there. What's more intriguing is how Buddhism treats the higher stages of wisdom. The path from being a good ordinary pe person to a truly enlightened being. One of the central tenets of Buddhism is that desire leads us astray and makes us crazy. We all want money and power and love, and we all secretly dread losing those things. And we all secretly know we are going to lose them when we die. So at some level, we all know that we are rushing around doing pointless things. And in Buddhism, inner peace comes from accepting the transience of everything, accepting that we will lose everything and therefore not trying to hold on. But Buddhism goes further. If everything is transient and desire leads you to ignore that, then desire blinds you to reality. It's not just that desire makes you do stupid things, it stops you from perceiving reality. What our senses tell us about the world, what we think is real, well, that's actually just a mix of our hopes and fears. The real world is actually something completely different. Some of this thinking appears secondhand in the Star Wars movies. George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, calls himself a Buddhist Methodist, and he made the Jedi Knights a bit like Buddhist monks. So remember when Luke has crashed his X-Wing in a swamp, and Yoda teaches Luke that with a clear mind you can lift a spaceship out of the swamp? And Luke doesn't believe his eyes. And Yoda says, that's your problem, believing your eyes. Instead, you need to use the force. Well, that last part, use the force, is just a Star Wars version of what Buddhists would call the power of a clear mind. But both for Buddhist monks and Jedi Knights, our senses are a bad guide to reality. We need Buddhist insight to know what's really real. And many things that seem logical at first are just symptoms of an unenlightened, distracted mind. Which brings us to an important question. How do you get that wonderfully clear mind? How do you attain enlightenment and become a Buddha? Well, in ancient Japan, that path to Buddhist wisdom was overwhelmingly associated with monastic life, monasteries, and abbeys. Monks and nuns separated themselves from worldly desire, they ate a Spartan diet, they avoided animal products, in order to avoid killing other sentient beings. They abstained from sex, alcohol, and most worldly temptations. They also meditated and studied sutras, transcriptions of lectures by wise monks and by Gautama Siddhartha. Now, as I've noted, Buddhism arrived in Japan sometime around the 6th century. 
and for the next three centuries, it was actively promoted by Japanese rulers. But why did rulers find this essentially monastic tradition so appealing? Why did they promote it? Well, first, promoting Buddhism was just part of what civilized kings did in East Asia. They did it in the Tang Dynasty, they did it in Tang China, and in Korea, and Japanese monarchs followed suit. So as part of the Ritsuryo state, the imperial court ordered the construction of monasteries and abbeys, and the printing of Buddhist texts. But in addition to just looking civilized, ancient Japanese monarchs hoped that the promotion of Buddhism would win them divine protection. Remember, what seems obvious to the unenlightened mind is actually an illusion, and what seems impossible to the unenlightened mind is actually easy for someone approaching Buddhahood. And at the risk of invoking Star Wars again, things that seem like magic to the pedestrian mind, well, that's just what Jedi do. They make things fly around with their minds. So for ancient Japanese rulers, promoting Buddhism, supporting Buddhist clergy could seem like almost magical protection. This idea is explicit in texts like the Sutra of the Golden Light. According to that text, the Buddha was delivering an explanation of the path to enlightenment. And when he finished, four great kings who were listening took a vow. They pledged that if any future king propagated and studied this Buddhist teaching, they would give him assistance by freeing his land from pestilence, by giving him and his subjects longevity, by making his soldiers strong, and by bringing harmony to his lands. And then the Buddha responded by saying, wonderful, and in addition to your vows of protection, studying this sutra and disseminating it will also help the king by making his ministers work together in harmony making his officials generous rather than covetous, and winning respect for his government. So this sutra guarantees good things in two ways. The first is quasi-magical. Heavenly kings will protect you. The second is a result of sutra study. It makes the government ministers moral, honest, and compassionate, and that leads to better government. Now, as a Japanese king in the 600s and 700s, you'd probably take one or the other or both, but those rulers seem to have been more impressed by the former, divine protection. For example, one of the oldest temples in Japan, Yakushiji, was founded in Nara around 680, after Empress Jito had fallen ill. Emperor Temmu prayed for her recovery, and he took a Buddhist vow, and he founded Yakushiji Temple with 100 monks, and then, of course, Empress Jito recovered. And in a similar spirit, Emperor Shomu, who commissioned the great temple of Todaiji, in the mid-700s, he ordered the construction of a temple in each provincial capital in order to stop a series of crop failures and plagues. And according to the imperial proclamation, Emperor Shomu ordered that, quote, every province should erect one golden image of the Buddha 16 feet in height and write out one copy of the Sutra of Perfect Wisdom. Well, what was the result of these imperial orders? Well, remarkably, because Shomu promoted Buddhism in this way, quote, the wind and rain were orderly and the five crops grew abundantly. In fact, since the Buddha statues worked so well, Shomu then ordered that each province erect a seven-story pagoda and write out a copy of the Sutra of Golden Light and the Lotus Sutra. Certainly that would bring continued prosperity to Japan. So we can make three key observations about the earliest forms of Buddhism in Japan. 
first, it was essentially a monastic rather than a popular religious movement. Second, its spread was catalyzed by direct support from Japanese rulers. And third, it was attractive to these rulers largely because of its presumed power to protect and sustain the state. Now, this ancient state-supported Buddhism was important in legitimizing the ancient state, and it was certainly crucial for spreading Buddhism across Japan. But it had its weaknesses. For example, because they were overwhelmingly dependent on state support, many of the temples supported by the imperial court in Nara simply disappeared when the court moved to Kyoto. And even more important, early Buddhism in Japan offered remarkably little for the laity to do, except provide for the monks and be protected by their prayers. So it's not surprising that two new forms of Buddhism began to emerge in the 9th and 10th centuries. Shingon Buddhism, an esoteric form of Buddhism, and then a more popular form known as Pure Land Buddhism. Now these two schools are very different from each other, but they are even more different from earlier state-sponsored Buddhism, because they were both concerned with engaging the laity both focused on having people do things to help themselves. Instead of focusing on royalty who could protect Japan by building temples, these new forms focused on what ordinary people could do to have a more auspicious rebirth. And unlike the earliest forms of state-sponsored Buddhism, both Shingon and Pure Land Buddhism are very much alive in Japan today. So let's consider Shingon first. Shingon was founded by the monk Kukai, who's often considered Japan's first important Buddhist writer. Kukai traveled to China in the early 800s as part of a government-sponsored mission. He studied there and was deeply impressed by esoteric Buddhism. The esoteric sects emphasized that advanced teachings needed to be kept secret from everyone except advanced students. Certainly there were ceremonies and services that anyone could observe, but many deeper truths required extensive prior training and initiations. You can't just skip ahead to Lesson 14. In that way, Kukai's Shingon school is similar to Tibetan Buddhism. And at the core of Shingon thought is the idea that Buddhist truth is difficult to apprehend. Kukai argued that words alone simply cannot capture Buddhist insight. So he took what I would call a multimedia approach. Shingon Buddhism relies on three tools, mudras, mantras, and mandalas. Mudras called inge in Japanese, are symbolic hand gestures. These are often depicted in Buddhist art, and these gestures are associated with various virtues. For example, a basic mudra is the gesture of hands resting in each other with thumbs touching. This symbolizes a correct attitude and a deep state of meditation. By contrast, the gesture of the right palm up and the left palm down symbolizes an absence of fear. There is a legend that the Buddha stopped a rampaging elephant with this gesture. So mudras are almost a Buddhist sign language. If you look at a Buddhist statue, the position of the hands is actually a link to the Buddhist liturgy. But for Shingon, in addition, it's useful to think of mudras as a physical way of expressing ideas. Remember that some Buddhist truths are said to be so sublime, so powerful, that they're effectively beyond words. So we can only apprehend them through physical sensation or through the physical representation of the mudras. After mudras, the second tool in Shingon Buddhism is the use of mantras. In fact, the Japanese word for mantra is Shingon, which in English means true word. It's the name of the sect. 
A mantra is a word or phrase that has a metaphysical connection to Buddhist truth. So while conscious language with grammar rules and dictionaries is of only limited use in attaining enlightenment, Kukai taught that one could use the secret true language, the ultimate language of the cosmos, to move towards truth. So it doesn't matter if you understand a mantra in Shingon Buddhism. If you chant it or hear it chanted, part of your understanding, your enlightenment, will be just the non-interpretive experience of the words. Then you might have it explained and then chant it. And again, this is an esoteric tradition. The truth unfolds in stages. The third tool Kukai introduced was the use of mandalas. Mandalas are extremely detailed paintings, or sometimes groups of sculptures, showing the relationship of hundreds of Buddhas and sages. And in Shingon meditative practice, the goal is to hold this totality in one's mind. For example, one of the most revered mandalas in the Shingon tradition is the so-called Wu mandala. And it's incredibly rich and detailed, with literally dozens of different manifestations of the Buddha and Buddhist sages. Just the center of the mandala has nine different aspects of the Buddha. In the middle is Dainichi, the most ethereal and intangible of all the Buddhas. Dainichi is the Buddha of all places and all times, the Buddha of the past, the present, and the future. Dainichi actually means great sun, and he was therefore associated with Amitarasu, the sun goddess. That's one great example of how Buddhism and Shintoism coexisted for centuries. Now, in the mandala, just below Dainichi is Amida, the Buddha of the past. As we'll see in a moment, there emerged an entire sect of Buddhism devoted to Amida. Now, below Dainichi's right knee is Kanon. Kanon almost became a Buddha, but he heard the suffering of less enlightened humans, and so he stopped just short of full Buddhahood. And so he's in a special space. He's almost a Buddha, but he's also attuned to human suffering because he didn't fully achieve nirvana and therefore didn't fully leave our human level of existence. Now, if all of this sounds impossibly complex and abstract, well, guess what? That's kind of the point. Shingon Buddhism revels in that complexity. If it were easy to explain, it wouldn't be Shingon Buddhism. But imagine that your meditation practice involves trying to keep an image this complex and rich in your mind. Not just all of these Buddhas, but all the details of the robes of each Buddha, the mudras of each Buddha. So clearly, Shingon Buddhism is strikingly different from Zen. In Zen, the goal is to clear your mind to think about nothing. In Shingon, you push out the distractions of the secular world by putting in complex images of the celestial world. Now, because Shingon Buddhism was so abstract, so demanding, it still assumed that only monks could fully master these abstract insights and move to higher levels of enlightenment. But this vision of deep and profound truths was compelling enough that Shingon was able to survive without state support. Wealthy patrons agreed to support Shingon, and in return they could watch Shingon ceremonies. And if you ever get the chance to observe a Shingon Goma fire ritual, do so. The chanting and the huge flames have a trance-inducing power. It's compelling even if you don't understand a word of the chanting, which again is part of the point of Shingon. We need to add mystical experiences to our basic sense of reason. And Shingon patrons could also be buried in Shingon cemeteries, and that ensured a more auspicious rebirth. 
And as a result, the Shingon Spiritual Center at Mount Koya, Koyasan, is a truly remarkable place. First, it's beautiful. It's a forested mountain temple complex with huge ancient trees. But it's also a microcosm of Japanese history because the Shingon graveyard is a sort of who's who of Japanese history. Starting in the 800s and continuing to the present day, there are grave sites for some of the most powerful and storied families in Japanese history, including imperial courtiers and great warlords, and then modern institutional grave sites, like the corporate memorial sites for the Nissan Motor Corporation and the Japan Professional Photographers Society. That one is easy to spot. There are photos etched in the granite. So while the ideas of Shingo and Buddhism are indeed incredibly abstract, powerful patrons have wanted to be a part of that tradition for over a thousand years. But now I want to draw a striking contrast with Shingo, the most ethereal of Japanese Buddhist traditions, because the Heian period also saw the birth of one of the most accessible forms of Buddhism, Pure Land. Pure Land Buddhism was popularized in Japan in the late 900s by a monk named Genshin. And Genshin's message was simple. The wicked go to hell. And there they are brutally tortured in ways that relate to their iniquities on earth. For example, if you killed someone in your human life, then in hell you would be ripped apart by swords. If you killed something and cooked it and ate it, then you would be boiled in a vat for eternity. Genshin's account of these horrific torments was extremely popular in the Heian period, and there were illustrated versions called Hell Scrolls that graphically illustrated the torments he described. So, like the great Italian poet Dante, Genshin created visions of hell that would inspire art for centuries. But Genshin's vision of hell was balanced by his understanding of salvation. According to Genshin, Amida, that Buddha just below Dainichi in the mandala, that Buddha was ready to save you from hell. According to Genshin, Amida had once taken a vow, back in the ancient past when he was only a monk, and he vowed that as part of his own path to Buddhist enlightenment, he would ease the suffering of any human to call out to him for help. He promised to take those people to a special paradise, the Pure Land. And then he did indeed achieve enlightenment. And so, of course, he kept his vow. So you can avoid going to hell by calling out to Amida. And that emphasis on salvation made Amida Buddhism, or Pure Land Buddhism, a great complement for other forms of Buddhism, like Shingon. If you're on your deathbed, regretting a life of sin and dissipation, Shingon is probably cold comfort. You could commission some prayers, but it's a little bit late to start meditating on a complex mandala. But Pure Land Buddhism was almost custom-made for deathbed regrets. There are even special paintings showing Amida descending from the clouds to rescue a repentant sinner. Some of these paintings even had strings, and you could hold the string and look at Amida in the painting. It was as though the string would guide Amida to you. And some great Heian nobles are said to have died holding strings attached to pictures of Amida. Now, we will come back to Pure Land Buddhism, because it became a powerful force in Japanese history. In fact, today, the Pure Land sects are the most popular form of Buddhism in Japan. But I want to leave you today with a sense of the tremendous diversity of Buddhist teachings. First were the state-sponsored forms of early Buddhism in Japan. They were critical in building the ancient imperial state, although today they have virtually no popular following. And by contrast, 
both Shingon and Pure Land continue to address the spiritual needs of Japanese Buddhists to the present day. And this is true despite the fact that they offer remarkably different perspectives on Buddhist teaching. Each of them has a distinctive influence on Japanese culture, and together they have coexisted for over a thousand years without insisting on an exclusive claim to Buddhist truth.